I've told this story several times. Um, it's kind of difficult to keep it tight. First of all, I want to let you know that I am a board member of Ohioans to Stop Executions. Uh, a lot of people ask me, well, why would you join that organization? Uh, why is it because you have a brother that's on death row? You would feel differently if you had a, a family member that had been murdered. And I tell them, I did. I had a brother that was murdered in 2007. He was shot in the back three times uh, on a home invasion robbery that went bad. The people went to the wrong house. He surprised them and he ended up getting murdered. I didn't have time to investigate that case. I had family members and other friends ask me, well, you investigated Kevin's case. Are you going to investigate this? I had to leave that to the police. I cannot bring Durad back. I had to keep all my uh, resources, had to keep my mind focused because I'm fighting a death penalty case. Uh, I pray for Durad a lot. Uh, he's gone. They say, would you want the guy to receive the death penalty? No, because you're going to take and drag our family through 10, 15, 20 years. You're going to make us keep reliving this and reliving this and reliving this. Uh, we don't want to do that. To give a guy uh, life without parole, it gives you closure. It gives you satisfaction. You know everybody's going to die. We know that. So if you give a guy life without parole, you know he's going to die inside there. So that is a version of the death penalty. You know, he's going to sit there a lot longer. We don't have to speed it up. We don't have to do any of that. And it's a lot cheaper. You know, we spend millions of dollars to execute one person when that money can be used to fight cancer. It can be used to put back into our education. It can be used to help our youth and maybe even our elderly. So those dollars are very valuable. And to see them wasted on taking a life, it's not productive. Once that person's dead, that money's gone also. It's like you're taking $4 million, putting it in the coffin with that guy and burying it. It's not productive. And that's not how money is supposed to be spent. If we're all supposed to be wise and know how to handle money. This is a total, it's a total waste. Now I'll tell you about my brother, Kevin. Uh, it's, a, it's a terrible story. Kevin was convicted of a murder in 1994 in Bucyrus, Ohio. They said that a black man entered into the home and there was three, two women shot and killed and there was a child. There was two other people wounded and another child wounded. So they got him for three counts of murder, three counts of attempted murder. They said that the perpetrator was from five foot eight to six foot eight. And I was like, wow, that's, <laughs> that's crazy. Well, anyway, our family, we sat through the trial. Uh, we assumed that the trial would be fair. You trust the police, you trust your judicial system. And we just, we knew that Kevin would be found innocent because he didn't do it. He had all the witnesses. I mean, everything was coming out. They were totally ignoring everything. He had witnesses sitting on the side that they never even called. It was a, it was a crazy case. Um, put these on. I didn't always wear these. Uh, Kevin, when I talked to him, he says, Charles, you know, uh, we had, they gave us an attorney. Uh, the attorney was not certified to handle capital cases. He was a single attorney. He tried to take all this on himself. The judge stated that uh, he, first of all, he said he court appointed this attorney. And then later after things went array, he says he didn't court appoint this attorney. And I know that rarely will attorneys come on and take cases, uh, you know, this costing $35 plus. So we could not understand why this guy took this case. And at the end of the trial, he says, well, you got what you paid for. And I'm thinking, well, we never gave you nothing. And I guess what he was telling us is neither did he. Uh, a gentleman wrote this quite some time ago, and it got me started uh, investigating my brother's case. Um, I spent, well, actually now 21 years of my life. I started this back in 1994. I was lost. I had no idea which way to turn, where to go. There was no support groups out there. There was no one out there that would help. And when you're talking about the death penalty, everyone's assuming he must be guilty. Well, there's a gentleman by the name of Martin Yant. And I met with Martin Yant. Someone says, well, give this guy a call. Well, I met with him. I could not afford him. But he gave me something. And I've held this thing for so many years. And it was citing some of the mistakes that was in my brother's case. So it was giving me some idea which direction to start going in. So you know, and I'm going to briefly go over some of this stuff for you. But it, it definitely mentioned that the attorney who wasn't certified to handle, handle capital cases, a carelessly selected and contaminated jury. And even the judge, after my brother was convicted, called him a snake in the grass. I mean, it was, it was horrible. Uh, the case was never investigated. Kevin was never interrogated. They never asked him whether he did it or whether he didn't do it. He didn't even know actually that he was arrested for a murder. 
they broke him, they came into the house, they beat him up, took him off, and uh, he ended up on death row 30 days later, well, from February to, to May. Um, they didn't investigate the case or ask for time to do so. Uh, they didn't move to excuse a juror who reported receiving threatening phone calls, a juror lying about discussing the case outside the courtroom, one reported receiving a collect call from a prison, and one seen being driven to the bank during uh, sequestered deliberations. He didn't object to hearsay uh, evidence, he didn't request a mistrial when the judge expressed fear for his own life, uh, didn't withdraw when he became aware he had a conflict of interest, and this, things go on and on and on. There were so many mistakes, I was like, oh my God, what do I do? Well, I was walking one day down the road, and I, there was a halfway house sitting next to me, and it says Correction Center. And I says, wow, I gotta get in there. So I went in, I volunteered. It gave me access to documents. I'm in there, I was filing all their papers, filing all these documents, but I realized they were all legal documents. I was able to talk to a lot of inmates, and most inmates, they have a lot of information, and putting them all together, it was like I had a lawyer. I could ask them all type of hypothetical questions. These guys had done considerable amount of time in prison, so they were able to give me answers, and it didn't cost me anything. I would take the phone book, and I would also call attorneys, and I would ask them hypothetical questions, and I would write down their answers. So that got me started in my investigations. So I go and I start talking to Kevin, because the, the appellate attorneys that we had, I'm not gonna say that they didn't do a good job, but I can say that they didn't do a good job. Kevin says, Charles, <laughs> with you at my attorney, I'm surely gonna die. So we talked about that. I said, hey, man, I'm all you got right now. So I started my investigation, and with working in the cor that correctional center that I was at, it taught me what the documents were. It showed me what I was looking for. Well, when I went to the police department, they were laughing. You know, they're very jovial. And they says, well, you can have whatever you want back there. And that was under the Public Information Act. I went back there, and I grabbed everything. And then I went home, and I was able to sort things out, because I, in order to explain something to somebody, you have to show things. This is one of those cases that didn't have DNA. Uh, they had no physical evidence. So there was nothing that I could argue against other than their theory. So I had to come up with my own theory. So I had newspapers all over the carpet, uh, all kinds of documents that I had found. I slept on the couch. But my carpet, my whole front room was just all documents, all papers. And I would go to sleep, and in that dream, and in dreamlike state, I was able to put these things together. So I knew that it was God working in me to help me understand this case because it was so complex, and I didn't have a clue of what I was doing. I would get up the next morning, and I was moving papers like chess, you know, to make sure how these things worked. And I was like, oh my God. So now I'm sitting around all day long. I wouldn't even leave the house. I couldn't wait to go back to sleep so I could continue to get this thing going. So I'm sitting there all day. Finally, I would fall asleep. And again, it would come to me. I'd get up the next day and I'm shuffling and moving papers. I mean, it was unbelievable. So, you know, I, I go to the Bible and I, I read the Bible a lot, but it just wasn't in me. I didn't feel it. I could sit and talk the Bible with anybody, but that works piece was missing in my life. You know, uh, it wasn't there, you know, to just talk the Bible. And so I flipped it open one day and it flipped to the trial of Jesus Christ. I says, oh my God. So I read that over and over and over and over. And I says, well, Charles, what would you do if you had been there? I don't know. So I thought about it for a while. I says, I would like to think that I would have spoke up. I would like to think that I would fight. I'd like to think that I would have done something. So something inside me says, well, fight now like you were fighting for Jesus Christ. So I fought for my brother with that same compassion, that same passion. It was just in me. It was a drive. And that has compelled me to continue on for these 21 years. Kevin's case was commuted. And I have to thank the Ohio Public Defender's Office, because when we finally got them involved and got some of this evidence to them, I mean, they worked profusely. It was unbelievable. It was amazing how they came together, how they worked as a team, and how they saved my brother's life. Because I realized that I couldn't do it. I couldn't represent him. And to see how they just put everything out there. I haven't seen Tim in a while. He's, he's here in this audience. So I've got to bring some attention to him. I, I really must do that. Uh, because he has meaning in my life, as well as some of his attorneys. I wish they were here, too. I would single them all out. So it's not like I did all this by myself. There's a lot of people that come to my aid. 
Uh, that's one thing when you get in trouble, you think you're back there by yourself and you know, it takes you to that little poem, the footstep, footprints in the sand. Well, you've always got somebody there to help you. God's always gonna put somebody in your life. Sometimes you just forget that. Well, we're going on and Kevin's case was commuted by Governor Strickland. Uh, this is the first case that was con commuted uh, by a governor for going against his uh, parole board. The parole board voted eight to nothing to execute. I sat there during that clemency and it was like watching a death squad. I mean, they were just there. And we put on this clemency for almost 12 to 14 hours. I mean, they said this is one of the longest ones in history. It was unbelievable, the evidence and the information that we had put on. The people that had came out in support of Kevin, it was just unbelievable. And after all that was said and done, we didn't convince not one of them, not one. And these are supposed to be educated, highly educated people. How could we not convince just one when I had to com help convince the public defender's office? There were so many people that I had to convince, and they saw it, but they didn't see this. And I said, this is a death squad. They're not interested in the truth. They're going to get this, 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 this execution. That's what I thought was going to happen. Well, I sat by the phone for several days, several days. The phones kept ringing. It wasn't the attorney. The phone would ring. It wasn't the attorney. Now I'm going nuts. Well, the phone rang. It was the attorney. She says, well, they commuted your brother's sentence. Ah, oh, yes. But they gave him life without parole. Ah, oh, now I got to explain that to my family. It took a while for it to register in my head. I says, how could they take him? And based on what we said, and our only claim was innocent. It wasn't child abuse. It wasn't mental retardation. There was no type of drugs or anything. It was actual innocence. In fact, when I went to the uh, the Ohio Public Defender's Office, they said he had no more appeals. We were done with appeals. I said, but I have all this information. They said, bring down what you have. I came down with boxes, suitcases of everything that I had gathered. Because I tell them, even in a sentence, that sentence is not complete until it has a period. So I knew everything meant something. Only I wasn't that attorney to, to be able to do all that. So I was able finally to get it to some attorneys and get this thing done. Let's get this ball rolling. So we got the sentence commuted. They gave him life without parole. This was back in 2000. 2010. So now I'm out here fighting a wrongful conviction. So I'm out here, I have to rehash the same information. And I tell myself, wow, didn't I just tell them all this? So you know, that energy level, you, you start losing that, that drive. But here again, here comes uh, my Lord and Savior. He says, hey, you got to get on out there. He says, they've been talking about me since my execution. And how long has that been? So I have to have that same passion, that same everything. I got that same drive because I can't let it go just like we can't let go of what happened to him. That's what makes us who we are. So here again, I'm fighting for Kevin Keith. And I've come across some people, again, he sent me some people to help me. Last night, a gentleman was sitting in the, in the audience and he came up to me and he says, hey, you know, uh, and he was a private investigator. And he says, you know, I think I got a couple ideas that could possibly help you. Wow. So coming to these events, you never know who you're going to talk to. You never know who's who. You never know who's related to anyone. So there's a lot of networking out there. There's a lot of good people out there. There's some bad ones, but you know, we're human. If half these recommendations, some of these recommendations have been put in place back then, especially videotaping interrogations and all that stuff. And Kevin wasn't even interrogated. That's why I couldn't find that information. Some of those things put in to safeguard these things, to make sure that things are done fairly. And that's what we're looking for. You know, I'd like to see the death penalty totally abolished. But we're working on that. At one time, I thought it was me out there by myself, and I was campaigning to eliminate the death penalty. That was my job, to abolish the death penalty. Well, once I hooked up with this organization of Ohio Wants to Stop Executions, uh, I had to tone it down just a hair because it wasn't just about my brother Kevin. It was about everybody on death row. It was about the death penalty. So I understood what, what this mission was. And uh, meeting some of the people on that panel, attorneys, private investigators, prosecutors, people such as Abe, it was unbelievable. I says, look at all the people that God has brought into my, into my life. I've learned so much, so much. It's unbelievable. I help people now try to understand how the law works because there's so many people out there that is ignorant to the law as I was ignorant to the law. You give them a bunch of papers and that's exactly what it is. They set it over and it collects dust and they didn't understand. So now I do have some understanding so I can help them uh, understand or what to say to your attorney or you know how to interact with your attorney. 
I tell people that I wasn't educated by Ohio State, but I was educated by the state of Ohio, and I want to thank you.